Chris joining us. Hello, welcome. Uh, and this is another. Well, it's the, we did a pilot. We did a little test LinkedIn Live a few weeks ago, um, and we talked about um, business planning more broadly. But this is the first of a new series where we're talking about planning, how to plan when it's impossible to plan. It's quite hard to plan at the moment, even though <laughs> the world seems to be, you know, recalibrating a little bit on its axis. It's still very, very hard to know quite what's coming around the corner. Um, and, and there are many businesses very much in limbo in terms of planning. So that's what this is about. And, and this series, I'm going to be talking to some very special guests uh, who have expertise that is miles beyond anything I can contribute. And I'm, my job is to try and tease that out of special guests uh, and, and good friends and colleagues of mine to uh, to try and answer the question, how do you plan when it is impossible to plan? And so this morning, we're looking at the subject of data, and I'm really delighted to be joined by Bonami Waddell. Bonami, how the devil are you on this sunny Tuesday morning? <laughs> Well, you've said it, I think. It's a sunny morning. Yay, finally, in August, we have sun. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, and we met uh, probably a couple of years ago, wasn't it? I think at a, at a, at a Brighton yeah. Commerce workshop uh, that I was leading, and you'd sort of not long set up your own um, sort of consultancy practice. Having yes. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your, your world and your business. And, and <clears throat> How what I do. <laughs> um, so I, um, my background was in PR and marketing. So I um, spent 20 years with large corporates, global um, organizations, and latterly, uh, the focus was around new business data and how we learn from the data that we're collecting from a new business perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I, yeah, as you say, I, let, I set up um, self-employed about four years ago. Um, to really help organizations to do the same thing. It's sort of what data have you got? What are you sitting on that can that can help inform your decision making? Um, and so giving a sort of evidence base, if you like, to, to the information, to the decisions that you're going to make. Um, I didn't really, I suppose I thought I would go in-house at one point. I wasn't, it wasn't a plan to definitely be self-employed, but um, I, I was delighted when I got contacted about a first project and it sort of, it sort of grew from there, to be honest. Um, so I call myself a data storyteller now um, and um, it's really, yeah, looking at data to make it accessible really and, and tell a bit of a story with it. And from that story, you can then make the decisions that uh, you're hoping, hopefully help you make the decisions you're trying to make. Yeah, yeah, and we'll um, we'll explore a little bit more about that storytelling angle and the. I mean, data is pretty meaningless, isn't it? Until it tells a story, until there's some insight, mm. until it does something. Otherwise, it's just it's just raw numbers usually, um, or yeah. some, you know, some some bits of information. Um, uh, so we're going to delve a little bit this morning into the role of data for particularly small and, and growing businesses um, when, when they are looking ahead. So when they're thinking about the future, so it might be that businesses are collecting data all the time. Well, we know that businesses collect data all the time. Some are really, really good at using that to, mm -hmm. to forecast, to create insights, to be able to tell their story, to be able to, to reset or re recalibrate what they're doing. Others, uh, I think it's fair to say, have not got a clue. And I've got all this data and they're going, well, I don't know what to do with it. You know, we'll just kind of carry on. But actually, they're sitting on a bit of a secret gold mine. Um, yeah. And there are many companies that could be collecting more data um, and, uh, you know, quite easily, quite cheaply, um, which could be quite transformative, but don't necessarily know how. So so you're a brilliant mm. person to know, and I can absolutely vouch for that. <laughs> and and always possible. Uh, we've really, um, really enjoyed working with you uh, as an associate on some of our projects and helping us to make mm -hmm. sense of, of data and helping our clients to make sense of data and pull together reports and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, and I think what's what's interesting is the the variety of ways in in which it can be used across sectors, services, and I think that's what I enjoy in this role because we're a service led business. We're working across so many different types of organisations and and sort of demystifying the word data and just trying to make it, it's kind of the intelligence that you have that sits within your organization. Yeah. And how can you tie that in with broader sets of information to to help you? And I think, uh, yes, yeah, that's what's interesting is the variety of ways in which it can be applied to the decision making. I guess, and I guess the first thing is to, to, to depoliticize or to demystify 
the idea of data because because <clears throat> a lot of people data is is a neg, you know there's immediately a negative thing around it because yeah. we think about data as tracking as surveillance as as monitoring as something intrusive you know they, we all think mm. you know in, in in this day and age any story about data in the press or the media will be about how you know the big tech giants are are using AI to monitor what we're having for breakfast in order to sell mm. that as bidder, or governments are tracking us in order to manipulate us, blah, blah, blah. It's always Bill Gates and 5G and vaccines and oh, all this crazy <laughs> stuff. Um, but actually, data itself surely is quite neutral. It's just information. And yeah. we've been collecting data for thousands and thousands of years, you know. Um, but it's just and I think that's what, that's what I enjoy about it, is that it's not, um, I suppose... Uh, if I go back to school days, I loved maths because there was a beginning, a middle and an end. It was the end of the problem. Like with English, it just sort of went on forever. No offense to English people. Um, but it, you know, there was a sort of, and that's the thing with data. It gives you the answer. You can't, you can, you can play with it and you can present it back in a way that might, you know, sway somebody's argument if you want to, but it, ultimately it, it is what it is. And so you, you're, it's not sort of, you can't make it up in that sense. So, you know, from, from your daily use, if you're using your Fitbit and you haven't done your hit your target, you just haven't, <laughs> it's not, it's not a lie. Um, so I think that's what, that's what I like about it. It's just, the answers are there. It's just knowing how to pull out the right sets of information and, and, and knowing what your question is to start with, to then be able to use it to help answer that question. And, 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 and being an Englishy person, uh, I, I, I would, <laughs> argue that even you know i i have a real fondness for for, for data certainly for for patterns for yeah. for for formula for looking at how you know there are certain ways there are certain sentences and sentence structures that work when you're presenting or or, or rating and a lot of that's down mm -hmm. to rhythm it's down to um the kind of things you're including in it you know and and, it, and again i will come to the storytelling bit in a minute mm -hmm. but understanding the numbers, the metrics, you know, you talk about half or you're talking about 50% or you're talking about one in two. Those three ways of talking about the same number mm. from a, a kind of communications perspective. Yeah. Elicit a different response in your audience. Um, yes, and, and definitely. So I just had this conversation the other day with someone actually and said, there's too many bullet points that say 75%, 25%. So actually, to make it relatable, if you're saying one in four of the kids that you're dealing with is suffering from X, or then it suddenly you go, actually, wow, okay, that's, yeah, it, it, there's more impact there. But I think there's a place for percentages. Um, but yeah, the language and the way that you tell it is it has definitely, like you say, has an impact on the audience you're trying to reach. So first thing I wanted to, to, to chat with you about um, mm. in terms of planning. So thinking about mm. that are that are thinking, okay, how how do I use the data that's available to me? How do I know what is data and what is or what's useful and what's not useful? You know, what ways can and do small businesses that you work with collect and use data? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I mean, I think sort of stepping back from that, there's a, a useful exercise to be done is a, is a sort of mini audit and without it having to be sort of lengthy or laborious, just spending an hour having a think about what it is that you actually have in front of you. Is it a customer database? Is it access to a survey that you ran recently? Is it um, some market research that you commissioned and then forgot about? Is it um, what is it that you've got sitting around you and across the team? So, you know, being wary of working in silos, it's it's looking broadly across all your teams within the organization and seeing what it is that you've got. Um, and then and then thinking about it in the different ways. So are you trying to drive new business? Are you trying to improve retention? Are you trying to access new audiences? What is it that your that your immediate challenge is? And then what are the sets of data that can support that so that you you have the sort of foundations, if you like, for, okay, this is where we are right now. And then these are the steps that we need to take to get to where we want to be. Um, and I think data gives you, I don't think we'd ever set, suggest that it's the be all and end all, but it certainly, it gives you those foundations and that sort of building platform, if you like, to then, to then be able to move on in the right direction and make those, sort of answer those questions. Um, um, and I use the word audit there, which I think is an interesting one, because, uh, you know, an audit doesn't just tell you what you do have. It also tells you what you don't have. And I think, you know, part of mm. the first step is to 
you know, to, to look at, okay, we've got Google Analytics on our website, so we've got a good idea of the kind of traffic coming in and what site, what pages people are looking at and, and maybe mm -hmm. where they're coming from in terms of some referral sites. But there might be something really key. Okay, which of our marketing campaigns actually led to, to that happening? And, yeah. and at that point, suddenly it might become a bit woolly or a bit more or guesswork. So then, so, so as a small business, you can start to think about joining up bits of action, activity and action. Yes, exactly. And I think things like that as well would be from, from a new business perspective, for example, are you tracking where your leads are coming from? So what's the source of that lead? It, it might go a few steps back. It might be that we met at a chamber breakfast and then, you know, a year on it's converted into a into a client relationship. But you're sort of a you're justifying the spend that you use as your subscriptions for your networking and for those those sort of platforms. But B, you're, you're, you're genuinely then understanding what the best sources are for you to generate new business. So I think I think it's quite, you know, we're all really good at going, having a hunch and a sort of gut instinct. Well, I know most of my business comes from here, but then, and is this size or, you know, so what is the size of the organization? What is the, um, the source of the lead? Those simple bits of information can actually tell you a lot if you, if you review that on a quarterly basis, for example. Yeah. Um, are you leaking money into an, into a network that isn't really giving any return? Um, but then you have to balance that with the, the, some networks might not convert, but they give you the support that you need and the um, the relationships that you need and the confidence that you want to sort of surround yourself with those people. Um, you have to sort of balance that with actually what's generating income. <laughs> But, but but what that forces you to do is to put a value on it. So so you're saying, well, that, mm. that activity is worth this, and that activity is worth this. That leads to this, and that leads to this. But until you start to break that down and view it as a kind of data source, mm. you can't really do that. You know, if you're not conscious of how things are working or not working, all you're yeah. doing is throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. And that that's fine for maybe the first year of a business, but but then it's hugely inefficient as you yeah. start to grow. And that ties into then what tools do you use for tracking and, you know, um, lots of conversations around customer databases and uh, how how much to invest and what level to invest that and that sort of thing. So I think, as you say, you start to build it up um, and without having any of that information, even just in a, in a spreadsheet, and I know spreadsheet makes people come out in hives sometimes, but, um, you know, just a list um, and something that, you know, you can quite easily reference and, and work out um, that sort of information quite quickly will help you um, just to sort of get smarter about the way that you spend your time and be more productive. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the, the obvious things or one of the, the natural things for people to do is once you start to build up a bit of a data set, okay, you've maybe tracked something over over a few months. It might be a, a, a new uh, marketing campaign or it might be a, some new activity that you're doing. Um, the temptation is to set a target on that really quickly is to go, right, okay, well, in month one, we had five. In month two, we had 20. In month three, we had 400 so the target should be a thousand by month six and suddenly <laughs> that's the whole thing they're given this thing or you know whatever um yeah is so you know measuring data data needs to be measured otherwise it's, it's it's useless and then that measurement gives you some kind of insight and some some clue as to what's happening but mm. it, is setting a target on that straight away risky i mean what are the pros and cons of using data to set targets on everything yeah, I think it. I, I think um, it, it can be a useful motivator, but I think there's always there's a the risk of it demotivating as well. I think you have to set context around it. So, um, if we were to take the last year of of business performance, obviously in a pandemic, um, there's been huge ups and downs for different businesses depending on where you operate. Um, so I think you have to set a, a sort of a benchmark based on a on a, a realistic time frame. Um, I think just trying to sort of get bigger doesn't necessarily always mean be more successful. Um, and I think the other the other area to be wary of is is volume versus value. So you know you can have a million conversions, but if they're worth less than the cost of whatever it is that you're producing, then then obviously it's it's going to fail. Um, so I think you have to think about um, what you're tracking, the ways that you're tracking it, and also um, 
yeah, the sort of setting setting realistic goals rather than just saying, yay, we're going to we're going to get bigger. And what's the point? Like, you know, on from a social perspective, it's not just about likes. And I mean, I'm not a I'm not a um, a social media data analyst. There's there's loads of people who are way better at that than me. But um, I, yeah, just being aware of why you're setting the target and very clear about um, if that's motivational. And if it's realistic, um, and not just setting targets for the sake of it, and uh, it, it kind of feels it's quite important that the you know the quantitative data, the the, the numbers, the the, the mm -hmm. targets behind that, you know, they have to speak to a a bigger goal, uh, a more a more of a vision, more of a qualitative target. You know, who do we want to be? What is it that we're trying to achieve? What change we're we trying to make? What mm. we're we trying to give? You know, growth is not just numerical, as you say. It's also about, um, you know, the kind of impact an organisation has, and, mm. the, and it's not just about headcount of staff. It's about what you know how those staff work well as a team. And as you say, the last eighteen months has has thrown so much of that. So many businesses were on a some form of trajectory, and it's just been completely disrupted. Mm. And we see how kind of crude data, uh, you know, using data to make quick decisions about where you put investment or support can be really problematic. You know, so many self-employed people uh, fell through the cracks. That's the phrase we use, isn't it? You know, in terms yeah. of government support, because it was it was using a kind of metric around the, the profit they made the year before. Yeah. It was counter to nearly how, to the, how nearly all accountants uh, encourage lots of self-employed people or people who are sole traders with a limited company of how they actually record their their accounts so yeah. lots of people missed out on that support because of a very common accounting practice but mm. the data metric that the government decided to use because it suited them and it was quick and it was easy and it's, and it's it's understanding the nuance of that it's understanding actually the data you're using and looking at might be at odds with some other data that you need to be compatible with so it's 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 you can't yeah about it no exactly and i think um um we've we talked about it before but vanity metrics really i mean don't just sort of there's this sort of element of navel gazing and and vanity that can come into data i think so you know if you're pleased with your 100 percent client satisfaction rate that's excellent but um within that there's there's going to be gaps and did you ask the right questions and so it's using it for it, celebrating and i think it's really important to when there are successes particularly from an employee engagement perspective celebrate those successes but also identify where those where those gaps are and those use it as a as a door opener to a conversation um so um yeah i think i think all too often everyone goes great where did we get the highest scores oh brilliant we're doing really well there there and there and that sort of middle rung often gets missed those who are kind of neither nor when you have a survey were you yes or you know did you agree or did you not agree and a lot of people sometimes sit in the middle there's a reason for that so exploring those kind of areas um is as important if not more so from a retention perspective um than than the wins i think the wins are important to just for morale and for for, for sharing um yeah for, for sort of general boosting um but the gaps are, are definitely important uh, my colleague Vicky shared an article about vanity metrics um, yesterday, actually, and I, and, I, and I was reading it with, with with interest. And I think it comes to that that storytelling part of, of of data, and and actually it can be quite manipulative. It can be quite. Uh, I mean, in in a, in a way, it's 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 really dishonest if if you if you use data. You know, you may not be lying about the data, but you're being so mm -hmm. selective that it's completely unhelpful and doesn't tell yeah. them well yes yeah, so you say i've got 100 percent customer satisfaction right that's because you maybe only asked your three most loyal customers and, and you didn't you purposely didn't ask the the 1302 <laughs> who complained about you now well they didn't reply so there's an even bigger <laughs> you're not lying, but you are you're being you're not you're, you're misrepresenting the reality to future clients yeah. and okay marketing is you know the whole job of marketing is to kind of take the average and make it irresistible fine there's going to be a bit of hype there but you're also building a kind of a, a, a distrustful narrative internally as well yeah you, you kind of your team you kind of start to believe it you go well we've got 100 customer satisfaction we must be really good but you're not really good 
you've got those <laughs> to improve on. And I think there's a lot of how, you know, data data can easily be be manipulated. And that's why so many yeah. people trust it. And it's been, a, you know, from a bigger picture point of view, it's been a really interesting last 18 months to have, you know, statisticians and, and chief medical officers and people standing up with slides saying, this is the data about this pandemic. Mm. And, 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 you know, most people have understandably gone, okay, you, you know this stuff, we'll, we'll trust you on it. But then there's a small but growing and louder set of people saying, this is, this is completely manipulative or it's very selective. And there have been some mistakes. They've admitted yeah. they've, they've, they've got things wrong and they've missed out bits and pieces. And that fallibility means that people who don't spend some time understanding data yeah. then just don't trust it at all. <laughs> yes, and I think there's the there's the mistrust, there's the sort of element of scaredness, um, you know, of fear around it. That's better. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it definitely, I think it can breed mistrust um, quite quickly. And that's why I think from a storytelling perspective, what's often the best way to bring it to life is to use the verbatims alongside the, the facts and figures. Um, I think having some strong quotes that feedback you can do that easily when you're data gathering with surveys for example or picking snippets from focus groups and that sort of thing but pulling out those quotes that really reinforce the message that you're sharing about 72 percent felt this it just really brings it to life and it and it makes it it just adds a level of validity to the data set that um says okay well they did actually get that from you don't have to name drop, but, you know, Joe Bloggs, where, wherever, or somebody who lives in such and such an area. Um, it, it's really, it just helps to boost it. It makes it more interesting to read as well. <laughs> um, so you talked a little bit earlier about the tools, and, you know, I think mm. that's, that's, that's a really big part of, of, of growing a business. Nearly every business starts with, you know, a, a pen and a piece of paper <clears> or, you know, an idea on a on a, on a back of an envelope or a note in a tablet or something and then as you as the years go on the months go on the the, the, the business grows uh the need to have uh tools that automate tools that that, that process and digest that communicate out obviously really important when i started my business always possible six years ago um you know apart from an excel spreadsheet and um mm -hmm. you know a, a few there were a few kind of early tools that you could do with a, with a bit of accounting there wasn't a lot you know um certainly zero quickbooks those sort of things were nothing like what they are now for, mm. for, for for getting data dashboards about your finances i mean that's incredible i don't know what i'd do without it but to be able to see <laughs> the finance you know the, the granular detail about the financial position of the business on yeah. my phone while i'm while i'm you know you know well, wherever i am at the touch of a button i can get a full data picture of 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 what's coming in and out financially. That's mm. in terms of saving time. And I don't need to be a qualified accountant to read it. Um, but also, you know, marketing tools and things like that. I, I've been on the phone this afternoon to a company called Lead Feeder. Um, you know, we're gonna be trialing some of their software, which means you you get much more detail about, as we were talking about, the kind of connection from, from a campaign to who's looking at your website. And it even starts to suggest and the, the names of people that are looking at your website. I don't know how mm. it We'll find that more. Um, but there's lots of these tools that are that are that are free or, or quite cheap to use. You know, what would you, yeah. where would you suggest to people to start, or, or or if they're growing a business, you know, what kind of principles should they have in mind when they're thinking about upgrading the tools that they use? I think I think um, I think it has to always start with what what's the question you're trying to answer, really. Um, I think from your perspective as a as a as a business owner. Like you say, that having that dashboard with you there and then financially, it means you can. It, it all helps with your decision making. And so, if that wasn't giving you useful insight, you would never look at it. So, from a decision making perspective, it's there. You know, it's going to give you the answer to the question, um, and 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 that's why you rely on it so much. And I think so. One for me is is Toggle. I, I track my time um, using Toggle. It's a free. I just use the free service, but it, you can sort of. You can you can start to get a sense of how long you're spending on different projects, and that gives you an idea from a budgeting perspective as well as a planning perspective. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, I know Excel is not everyone's friend, but it is a simple, easy, useful, handy way to get started, and you can do a lot on it. Um, 
and it's kind of there and we've all grown up with it. So um, I would definitely give it a plug. Um, but also things like Google Forms, um, survey, uh, um, survey tools that can that, that all have that basic free subscription. So just to get out there and use it as a way to chat to your customers, get that feedback, start to gather that information. Um, they're all just available. Um, I think it's just that balance between don't spend hours looking at it and then <laughs> you go down this warren of um, endless kind of, oh, this looks good and shiny and new and let's try this. And um, so I think it's uh, what's the question you're trying to answer and then and then, you know, speak to the right expert to get the advice to get the right tool, really. I think what, what you said there is, is absolutely critical. The data helps you to make decisions. If it doesn't help you to make decisions, then ignore it. Or don't, don't spend so much time on it. You know, this is that's it's one job, really, isn't it? It's uh, data should help you make decisions. So whether it's yeah. it turned into a, a wonderful, you know, sales pitch using lots of facts and figures, uh, that's to persuade people and to help to make a decision whether to choose something or not, or whether you're using mm -hmm. it in a dashboard about your finances or about marketing campaigns or about you know how 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 many proposals you've put in have, have converted into to people's interest you know all of that stuff helps you to go well make decisions let's do more of that yeah. let's do less of that and that really is what we you know hope people um get out of today because i think i think data can be really confusing or, or conversations around data if it's not something you studied maybe you mm -hmm. don't have a maths or a, a physics brain uh or people perceive that they don't, you know, because that's not what they've studied to a, to a high degree. Mm. You know, I, I really don't have a particularly mathematical brain, but I absolutely adore data. And, and the more the older I get, the more I'm delving into <laughs> it, the more I love it, which I never thought would happen. Um, and you get sort of lost in it, I think. And I think that's the point. I think is um, I know that you know, quite often the conversations that I have are around. Um, just you say the word data. I've been I've been playing for ages with how to talk about myself for that very reason because you say data and everyone's like, Ugh, and you know they just want to walk off and talk to the next person. But it, it's how to sort of um, to bring it to life and not think of it as a scary spreadsheet sort of thing. Just think about it as information that's really interesting about your business. I mean, everyone enjoys having an hour to talk about themselves. <laughs> so if thinking about it as having an hour to spend on your business, talking about your business essentially, and what is it that that, that intelligence that you've got around your own business um, that you can use to help grow? Yeah, and, 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 more, and, and actually there's credibility in talking about yourself because you're not just talking about yourself because, you know, you, you think you've got a great idea and you're, and you're the best thing since sliced bread mm -hmm. and you know, it's your ego <laughs> driving it. When you start to use data properly, You've got evidence. Actually, yeah, yeah. What, what our business has been able to do is genuinely useful because X, Y, Z happened, and we were able to mm. turn this to this, and we worked with these people, and we sold this many products, which is now in twenty-five different countries, and we know these many people are using it, and they're coming back. And we've got evidence they're coming yeah. back. We've seen the data. That stuff shows that it's you know it's 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 kind of hard to argue with that if the data yeah. is displayed honestly. Exactly. And I think as well, it's it's even if you've just starting up and you've got one client, you know, that you've already then gathered information. What was it that worked? What didn't work? And from there, the next time you've got two people saying it and three and so on. And suddenly you've gathered a trend. You don't have to be it doesn't have to be sort of pinpoint accurate, but you're you're getting that 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 trend towards something and that general um, overall feeling is X or Y. Um, yeah. Um, just, we're, we, we're not going long left, and I just wanted to shout out to Candice and, and to Valerie who are who are uh, listening in. Thank you for that. Both saying, um, looking looking forward to understanding more about data. Well, hopefully we've 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 touched some of that for you. Um, in the in the in the in the dying seconds, two things I want to point out. One is there's loads of data available, publicly available, more than there's ever been from places like the the, the local enterprise partnerships, uh, BIPCs, business and IP centres at local libraries. They're now making data available to business for free. So we'll we'll um, we've got we've got information on that on our website, alwayspossible.co.uk. So I think that's a new area for businesses to help with their yeah. planning. Um, but also just get get outside help. So follow me, you work with small businesses, always <laughs> we work with small businesses, you know, our program called the hundred, which is a way to, um, you know, we're looking for a hundred really exciting businesses that want to plan in different ways, including with data. And you can work with me, you can work with Bonomi, um, you know, get, get, get some external help. It's probably cheaper than you think. It's probably more comprehensive <laughs> than you think. Um, and it's and impartial. I think that's the key word as well with data. 
bringing impartiality in. Absolutely. Um, we ran out of time, but there's going to be links yeah. and um, we'll, we'll, we'll share the video to this. But uh, check out alwayspossible.co.uk forward slash 100. Um, we, the next uh, LinkedIn Live is on the 24th of August, and we're, we're talking about grants and funding with, with Sam Hawkins. Um, and grants and funding is all about data, so it'll be a good follow on from this. Bonami, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much so for having me. me. You're very welcome. <laughs> Bye. Bye.